Thanks for listening to the Mornings with Carmen LaBerge podcast, made available thanks to support from listeners just like you. Encouraging you to live as an ambassador of God's kingdom in the world. This is Mornings with Carmen LaBerge on Faith Radio. If we're gonna fly, we fly like eagles, arms out wide. If we're gonna fear, we fear no evil. We will rise by your power. We will go by your spirit. We are bold. If we're gonna stand, we stand as giants. If we're gonna walk, we walk as lions. Hey, hey, look out! Look out! Hopelessness is trying to creep in there. You see it? You sorry, you see it trying to creep into your thoughts? You see hopelessness or despair trying to creep in through the cracks? Yeah, we're going to shut it out today. Mm-hmm. If you were wondering, hey, what's Carmen up to this morning? Carmen is going to shut the dough. Yep. Have you ever have you sung that lately? Shut the dough, keep out the devil. Shut the dough, keep the devil in the night. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> we're going to shut the dough. This morning, because we are going to open our hearts and minds to the unfailing love of the Lord our God, we're going to set our hope in Him. I'm Carmen LaBerge. You're listening to Mornings with Carmen here on the Faith Radio Network. And if you, uh, if you, now that I've alerted you to it, if you have recognized that in fact hopelessness is trying to creep in, despair is trying to invade your thoughts, then uh, get ready because we're going to shut the dough right now. Uh, as Christians, we are not immune from hardship. Um, we're, not, we're not immune from, uh, from fear or the things that produce fear or anxiety. We're not, we're not immune for, from struggles. I mean, I think about in James, when, uh, when James says, Consider it pure joy, my sisters and brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, um, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And you say, okay, so uh, obviously James and others were facing trials of many kinds. Well, yes, we know that, right? We actually know that generation to generation to generation, um, Christians face trials of many kinds. We wouldn't have, um, we wouldn't have a testimony of martyrs whose blood cries out, um, and and through whose witness and testimony the Church of Jesus Christ is built over generations. If Christians in every generation. We're not facing trials of many kinds. And so we recognize that being Christian doesn't make us immune from difficulty. Um, It certainly doesn't make us immune from death. And so where are you putting your hope? Not only in this life, but for life to come. Where are you placing your hope? Our Growing Your Faith verse of the day comes from Psalm 33, verses 20 to 22. And if you're not already getting the Growing Your Faith verse of of the day in your inbox, you should be, and you can sign up for it at myfaithradio.com. So today's Growing Your Faith verse of the day from Psalm 33, verses 20 to 22. Now, I I want you to recognize that this begins with a declaration of faith. This, these verses are a declaration of faith and then a prayer. So the declaration of faith, we put our hope in the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him, our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. And then the prayer, let your unfailing love surround us, Lord, for our hope is in you alone. The declaration of faith, we put our hope in in the Lord. Not just you and I as individuals, but we, we together put our hope in the Lord. I stand there on the solid rock believing when you are slipping and falling, when the sands are shifting beneath, uh, feel like they're shifting beneath my feet. You're the one whose feet are on solid ground. We together put our hope in the Lord. Yes, we do so individually, but man, we're in this together. And so if if hopelessness is sneaking around and trying to creep in and invade your thoughts, you got to reach out to your brothers and sisters in Christ and say, hey, you know, give me a hand here. Together we put our hope in the Lord. Remind me of his goodness and his faithfulness. Remind me of the character and the ways of God. We put our hope in the Lord. 
We pray together, our Father. We stand and declare together what we believe. He is our help and our shield. That's a declaration of faith, my friend. And so let me ask you, is he your help and your shield? Are you first and always running to the Lord your God for help, for shelter, for refuge, for strength, a very present help in times of trouble? The psalmist says, in him, in him, in the Lord in whom we've put our trust, in him, in the Lord who is our help and our shield, in him, in him, our hearts rejoice. For we trust in his holy name. There's a relationship here between hope and rejoicing and trust and the faithfulness of God. Is God your place of rejoicing and the one in whom your heart rejoices? Even in the midst of the things uh, for which you're running to him for help and as your shield? I mean, just think about that. We put our trust in the Lord because, you know, everything around us is sinking sand. And we acknowledge that he is our help and our shield because we need help and we need a shield. So the psalmist is declaring in the midst of some kind of travail, some kind of challenge, some kind of difficult life circumstance that he needs to run for help and salvation, for shelter from a stormy blast to the Lord. And he's putting his hope in the Lord. And then he says, and, and in him, our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. Are you trusting in the name of the Lord our God today? Because from that place of trust, once you've put your hope in him, you can then pray with the psalmist, Oh God, let your unfailing love surround us, for our hope is in you alone. The unfailing love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. Right now, God wants to envelop you with his unfailing love. He wants to surround you in the shelter of his, of his arms of his character, of his goodness, of his grace. But you have to put yourself in proximity um, to him. you got to put your hope in him. You have to allow him to be your help and your shield. You have to trust in his holy name. You have to put your full faith and confidence in him and his unfailing love. And then, trust me when I tell you, you will feel him envelop you in his unfailing love. Oh God, surround us today in your unfailing love, for our hope is in you alone. Put your hope in the one who is unfailing in every way. Take up every other uh, tent peg and lay it all down uh, right there, right there with God. Our brother Billy Hollowell is going to uh, join us next. We're going to survey some of the conversations he's been having over at Faithwire. We do this so that you can be encouraged and inspired and equipped with some stories of others who are out there walking by faith and not by sight. Um, it's it's helpful for us to hear the stories of fellow Christians and how they are facing the challenges of the world and how they're walking their faith out into the world that God so loves and doing so in ways that honor Jesus. So from our sister in Christ, Rebecca St. James, to, well, our brother in Christ, Dog the Bounty Hunter, and Willie Robertson. All that up next here on Mornings with Carmen. All right, it's time again to talk with our friend Billy Hollowell. You can find what we're talking about today at faithwire.com. Hey, Billy. Hey, how's it going? Well, it's... um. You know, the Lord is the Lord is doing his thing. So everything else is kind of secondary to that. I guess it's going I, I guess that. it's going great based on that. <laughs> I love that. No matter what's going on, the Lord is doing his thing. Yeah, the Lord is doing his thing. Um, so uh, like many, many people across the country, um, I have had an opportunity recently to see the movie that features um, 
you know, the bands that we know as Rebecca St. James and for King and Country. And as a part of that, I think um, you have had an opportunity to uh, to spend some time talking with them on, on various occasions. You you heard some things from Rebecca St. James that I thought would be really good for us to lift up today. Yeah, you know, it's funny. Over the years, I have never interviewed her before. Um, and really? she had left. I, it's weird. I mean, because a lot of these people, you know how it is, you know, in, in our job, we talk to a lot of different musicians, a lot of different Christian artists. But for some reason, I had never crossed paths with her. So getting a chance to talk with her uh, was really nice because it was the first time I had been able to do that. But you know, she really dove into some things that I thought they went much deeper than the film itself. Um, you know, Unsung Hero, great movie. But what she was talking about is this sort of, you know, momentum that she sees in the arts, not just movies, but music, too, where the quality, it's sort of this transformational Christian content. The quality is rising. More people are interested. And, you know, we're sort of on the precipice of something she thinks that that is a wave that we're riding and that this is really just the beginning. And movies like Unsung Hero, you know, in her view, are evidence that the quality and, you know, the quantity are both going to increase. When um, when you're talking with her, like, and you're talking about some things, maybe some threads to pull from um, from the movie. I mean, did you talk about her mom? Did you talk about um, the experience of being, you know, kind of uh, watching someone else play her? Like, what 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 did the, what was the conversation like? Yeah, she did. You know, a lot of it really focused on the mom being the, the unsung hero, right? That the mom held everything together for this family. I mean, you picture coming to this country, you know, from Australia, you get here, you think you're going to have a job, you end up with no job, with no furniture, you have this house you're in, your kids are sleeping on the floor. And yeah, you can see in the movie what goes on. But what was so interesting is that and I've heard this from other people, too, including Candace Cameron Bure, who executive produced and starred in the film, too, that there were so many miracles this family experienced while they were struggling that they couldn't put them in the film because it would have seemed unbelievable. Um, they mm -hmm. just kept having miracle after miracle. But but the point being that the mother was really the centerpiece of keeping this family together. When the kids are complaining that they're going to be sleeping on the ground, you know, where's our mattress? When are we getting a bed? She's like, this is an adventure, right? She does what moms do. She finds a way to turn it back around to make it a positive. And you see that in their journey. But um, really, the other thing, obviously, there are liberties that have to be taken. But all the events, she said, are events that happened to them. You know, the, the movie steer steered not too far away from what they actually faced. And so I don't want to spoil too much of it, but they knew they had at least a book, she said. But when it came time to tell the story, doing it in movie form, you know, made made the most sense. And I, you know, I did ask her, did you, you know, what's it like? You know, you have to put full trust in somebody, whether it's your brothers or not, you know, you've got to be able to put that full trust in. And so they really, they had full trust in their family members to present their parents and it, and look, this is a difficult light. You're showing people at their worst and then at their yeah. best, and and nobody wants to be shown at their worst, right? But they did a beautiful job. Yeah, unsung hero. I just really couldn't uh, recommend it more highly myself. Uh, again, we're talking with Billy Hollowell from um, Christian Broadcasting Network and Faith Wire. You can find the stories we're talking about today at FaithWire. dot com. All right, here's a name that may be completely unfamiliar to people: Dwayne Chapman. However. Dog the Bounty Hunter, likely not unknown to people. So um, better known as Dog the Bounty Hunter, there's a brother in Christ named Dwayne, and he's on a mission to help people discover the gospel. Uh, one of the things I really appreciated, not only about this story, but about the Willie Robertson story we're going to talk about here in just a moment, I really appreciate how God uses all kinds of people because <laughs> because I am proximate to different people than Dwayne Chapman, Dog the Bounty Hunter, is proximate to. And he's proximate to different people than Willie Robertson is proximate to, and on and on and on. So uh, tell us about uh, Dwayne Chapman, better known as Dog the Bounty Hunter. Yeah, you know, I laugh because he's always a wild interview. You know, I've interviewed him a number of times, and he's, always, he's just so interesting. I mean, this is somebody who has had a reality show. Obviously, we know him from Dog okay, the Bounty he Hunter. he is a reality show. He is like, a reality show. It's I, who he is. It's yeah. who he is, right? You talk to him and you're like, I'm in the show right now. And so it's <laughs> it's interesting, though, because I actually had interacted quite a bit with his wife before she passed away. And she was very, mm -hmm. very nice. Um, she had cancer. She passed away a few years ago. And he's since remarried a woman named Francie. And they do ministry together. But 
But what's so fascinating is this is a guy who went to prison in the 1970s, right? And we talk about this in the story. You can read it over at Faith Wire. He went to prison. He came out of prison. He had grown up in a home where his mother prayed nonstop. So he had this prayer warrior mother. He ends up in prison. He gets out and he becomes a bounty hunter, right? He, he's chasing bad guys down. Um, and that's what he does for a living. So he, he obviously changes his life, comes into his faith. Uh, and, and really re-embraces what he grew up with and goes on to get this reality show. And I think when, when somebody's a character of a human being, they're the perfect mm-hmm. fodder for reality TV, right? And it was a compelling and interesting show. Uh, but but he's a compelling and interesting guy. Like you're saying, he's out there preaching to people who maybe you and I would not be able to preach to. And he's written this book now, and the book is called Nine Lives and Counting, A Bounty Hunter's Journey to Faith, Hope, and Redemption. And it talks all about finding faith, hope, and redemption. So we had a chance to to talk about that. We talked about his late wife and really how he picked the pieces back up and what he's trying to do now, which is to share the gospel with people. He said, you know, my faith has grown ever since Beth, his wife, passed away about five years ago. And so he's rather than going the other way, he's clung deeper into his faith. One of the things that I appreciate about conversations like this is that you know, we see a person, Dog the Bounty Hunter, and we we know, we think we know some things about him. And then when we actually pause long enough to sort of survey a person's life, and you think about maybe that day that, um, that he was arrested, the day he was sentenced, the day he went to prison, and you think about the way his praying mom right? He's raised by a praying mom in a Christian home. And you think about all of the things that she must have been feeling and experiencing on those days. And then over the course of time, as he, you know, after spending time in jail, um, becomes a bounty hunter, right? God gets a hold of him. I mean, on and on and on the testimony, right? And then his, not his, just his redeemed life, but the life of redemption that he seeks to live for others. And you think, okay, okay, I can pray today. I can, I can be a praying mom, come what may. I can trust God with my kids and my grandkids. Like, this is one of those kinds of testimonies. And so I just really appreciate you not only bringing it forward this time, but, um, but over time. Again, we're talking with Billy Hollowell. Uh, we've been talking about Dwayne Chapman, Dog the Bounty Hunter. There's a piece uh, posted at faithwire.com right now, uh, a conversation and an interview about his latest book, Nine Lives and Counting. But we're going to um, have a conversation with Billy here in just a moment about another very well-known character. Maybe you know him mostly from Duck Dynasty, but he's also a brother in Christ and he's got something to say. And his name's Willie Robertson. That's up next here on Mornings with Carmen. This is Susie Larson, host of Susie Larson Live. Maybe you have a loved one that you've been praying for for years, and they still haven't trusted Jesus. Or maybe you have a loved one who once had a vibrant faith, but has since walked away. If this is true for you, know this. You're not alone. God sees you. He loves you. And he knows about the heartache you feel. And we care about it, too. I've recorded 15 audio clips to encourage your soul. Text the word HEART to 877-933-2484. All right, are you familiar with Duck Dynasty? Are you familiar with the Robertson clan and their ministries? Willie Robertson recently had a conversation with our friend Billy Hollowell, and Billy's here today to tell us about that. All right, Billy, um, what did you learn in this conversation with Willie? Ooh, Billy and Willie. So, that could be like Billy a, and Willie, I mean, yeah. We, its own show. It, that could, You know what? Why don't you pitch it? I, I'm all on board. I, I love the Robertsons. I think they're great. And I learned, first of all, I learned a new word, and I'm going to say it the right way because I kept saying it the wrong way to him. Gospeller. Gospeller. I kept saying gospeler, which I think sounds better, but whatever. Gospeller is a term that I had never heard. It's an old school word for somebody who shares the gospel. And so it's the title of Willie Robertson's new book. um, And that book is called Turning Darkness into Light, One Conversation at a Time. And it's all about the importance of evangelism, one-on-one evangelism. And this is what I love about these people, the, the kooky fun family that made duck calls and had a fun, had one of, you know, reality TV and cable TV's biggest shows ever. They're actually very serious people who share the gospel, baptize people are constantly talking about evangelism. And it's just so interesting to me Um, to see that dynamic. So we talked all about 
really how we got where we are. And we actually have another story that will be coming out. We'll have two stories on this interview because it was so um, packed with just great information. Um, Willie felt impressed upon by God to talk about this issue of evangelism. And so he chose to write this book on it. And, you know, you know, the family story was told through the blind, you know, which is a feature film. I'm kind of getting back to our earlier conversation, a really great film, well-written, well-acted film about the, the story of Willie's parents. So we talked through essentially when you evangelize to somebody, it's a snowball effect. They're going to share with somebody else. They're going to share with somebody else. And we can go all the way back to the disciples, right? If we, if we could track it all um, of people, just who told the person who told you, right. And who told them. And so, you know, it's really just compelling in their own story because there would have been no duck dynasty had somebody not stopped Phil Robertson from a life of alcoholism, um, mistreating his family, kicking his family out, um, cheating on his wife, and he had a change of heart, found Jesus, and that changed not only their family, but so many lives around the country. Yeah, and including a friend of mine right where I live. Um, and so, I mean, who shared with me that, like, you know, it's 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 because of the Robertsons. It's because of Phil Robertson and his testimony and um, that that he came out of a life of addiction um, and, and into faith. And so that snowball continues even in the community where I live. So yeah, absolutely. It is a testimony that continues to pour forth. I want to give you the opportunity to introduce us to and tell us about Branson Baker. Now here is a person um, who, I mean, nobody listening, I feel confident, knows Branson Baker. Um, Everybody maybe knows Willie Robertson and a lot of people know Dog the Bounty Hunter and certainly people know Rebecca St. James. But one of the things that you're doing at Faithwire is you're bringing forward stories about um, about people we would never otherwise hear of and don't know. So introduce us to Branson Baker. Yeah, this story is just incredible. He is a nine year old. Okay, I have I have an eight year old. She'll be nine soon, and I just can't picture her in this situation. He was with his parents on April 27th. They were in their car in their truck trying to get to a safe house because there were tornadoes that were hitting all around them in Oklahoma. And as they were in the car, they were driving the truck, trying to get to that safe spot. A, It's just insane. A tree uprooted, slammed into the car, and it trapped Branson's parents inside. And they weren't just trapped. They were badly injured. And so here he is. It's nighttime. It's dark. The only light you have is the lightning in the sky. There's a tornado there. And this nine-year-old is able to get out of the car, Branson, and he runs over a mile to find help in the dark as the tornado is raging. He finds somebody to come and get help and come back to help his parents. And at the same time, it turned out his uncle was on the phone with the family when this happened. And so the uncle was racing to the car to try to help them. He knew kind of where they were based on the phone conversation. And when it went dark, he knew something happened. So, but this little boy runs, gets help, comes back. And, you know, he's in tears talking about this to Good Morning America. He's like, I was really, really scared. Um, and he told his parents, please don't die as he ran away. But I mean, what nine-year-old, most adults wouldn't have the wherewithal to run a mile and find help, you know, in the middle of this storm. And so it's just a crazy story. And his his dad and his mom are okay. His mom was still in the hospital as of the other day. His dad's in a neck brace. They have broken bones. But they are so fortunate that their brave son went and, and got help to save them. We're talking with Billy Hollowell. You can find more of that story at faithwire.com. Um, Billy, it was one of those stories that reminds us just how far, um, you know, how far God is willing to go to save us and that help has to come from the outside and that sometimes, um, you know, you've got to run with endurance the race that is marked out for you. Um, It just is really one of those extraordinary, extraordinary, um, yes, real time reminders of um, of the opportunities that we have as Christians to bear to bear witness to something great and greater um, than the stories that the world is telling. Yeah, absolutely. And and being able to do that and you get to do that and I get to do that, it's such a privilege to be able to tell these stories, point people toward these stories. And it's just, it's a true joy. Yeah. Um, for those of you who haven't heard yet, Justin and Haley Bieber are going to be parents and that little uh, birth announcement is also at faithwire.com. So lots of good news to go around. You should uh, you should check it out. Faithwire.com. Billy, as always, thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. 
Okay, does anybody know the Borg family in Edina? I know, this seems like maybe like a random question here uh, this morning, but uh, do you know the Borg family in Edina, Minnesota? I'd like to connect with them. Trisha and Brian Borg, they've got five kids, including three-year-old Michael. Uh, he is a living miracle. I, I think we should talk with them. I think we should I think we should hear their story. What do you think? You can... You can text me if you happen to know Miracle Michael, the four-year-old Edina boy um, who has beat the odds, who is featured right now at Fox 9 um, uh, there in the Twin Cities. Um, I, I mean, I can tell you his story, which is extraordinary, or we could track them down and get them to tell, tell us themselves because I think that would be really cool. I think that anytime you choose life, um, when when the world suggests that you have other options, I think any time that you're teaching your other kids um, about sometimes love is a sacrifice. I love this. Um, Mom Trisha says, well, for all of our kids, obviously it's been a sacrifice because um, Michael's life has been very, very difficult, but it's also just full of just extraordinary joy. So she says of her, of her kids, you know, there's a lot of beauty in it. Our conversations with them center around, center around, this is what love looks like. Sometimes we have to sacrifice or we're called to love when it's inconvenient and it's hard and you can't do what you want to do. And that's what being a family looks like. And we are there for each other. I, I want to know them. I want to, I want to talk with them. So if you know, um, uh, Brian and Trisha Borg, um, in Edina, I want to know them as well. So could you get us connected? Um, you can text us at 877-933-2484. You can always email Paul or me, Carmen. Paul is Paul at MyFaithRadio.com. I'm Carmen at MyFaithRadio.com. We would, um, we'd love to have that conversation. And for those of you who want to um, want to see or hear the story that I'm talking about, it's at Fox9.com. Miracle Edina Boy Beats the Odds. Um, and I'm just going to hold out hope that we're going to get them, you know, on here to tell their own story because, wow, it's profound. And if we can't, then I'll circle back around and tell you, um, tell you that whole story um, on another day. I want to talk about life and death. Yep. I want to talk about life and death. If I told you that I had some good news and I had some bad news, which one would you want to hear first? You want to hear the good news first? You want to hear the bad news first? Hmm. You know, the bad news and the good news, that's kind of a, uh, that's kind of a merry-go-round, is it not? So do you want to hear the, the good news and then the bad news and then the good news that follows the bad news? Yeah, let's do that next. Let's do good news and bad news. Let's talk about life and death. You're listening to Mornings with Carmen. a little conversation this morning about life and death. It's a life and death conversation. You know, not, you say to yourself, you know, not every conversation that we have is a life and death conversation. And I, I actually would argue that it is. I'm Carmen LaBerge listening to Mornings with Carmen. Let's have a little life and death conversation this morning. And you're like, might be a little early for conversation about life and death. Really? Might, might actually be a little late. It's never too early for a conversation about life and death, but it can be too late for a conversation about life and death. So are you having life and death conversations? We need to be having life and death conversations every single day. Then you can have those conversations as good news, bad news conversations. You can be like, hey, um, I got some good news and I got some bad news. Which one you want first? It might be a surprise to you that good news is a part of the conversation about death and bad news is, is part of the conversation about life. So if you want to be having life and death conversations, you're always having good news, bad news conversations. The question is, you know, are you helping people understand all that's happening in life and all that's related to death in the context of conversations about the good news, like the capital G good news? The bad news is related, well, to life sometimes, like what? I, I don't, I mean, we don't just in life go from like, you know, one, one ecstatic, joyful moment to the next. No, I mean, there are valleys. And some of those valleys, you and I actually know, are journeys through shadowy, dark, difficult, lonely, desperate times. 
We call it the valley of the shadow of death. And so you can have a life and death conversation with anybody on any given day because everybody knows, everybody knows the journey through the valley of the shadow of death. The difference is you and I know it as a place where we don't have to be afraid, where we are not alone, where goodness and mercy follow us all the days of our life because we know where we're headed. We know what happens at the end. We know who's waiting for us. We know he's gone before us to prepare a place. And we know that in the meantime, he's given us his Holy Spirit and one another. Does everybody that you know, literally everybody that you know, do they know, do they know that comfort in the midst of the valley of the shadow of death? And if they don't, then you need to have a life and death conversation with them today. Today, because today's the day. Today's the day the Lord has made. And today, for some people, is going to be the day of salvation. How cool would it be for you to get to be a person that God uses in someone else's salvation story? How cool would that be? That'd be so cool, right? So that means you and I are going to have to have some life and death conversations. And if you ask somebody, hey, do you want me to start with the good news or the bad news? I got some good news. Let's have a good news, bad news conversation today. You know, I wouldn't maybe jump in and tell them you want to have life and death conversations, but maybe you do. Maybe that's the way to start. Um, let's just jump right in and have a life and death conversation today over coffee. Whew, okay. Well, you want to start with the good news or the bad news? It doesn't really matter what people, what people pick there, right? Because you know that that's a hand in glove kind of thing. The good news is good news because the bad news is really bad. And everybody is headed toward it because counterintuitively, the good news is about death. (laughs) Because although death comes, because of Jesus, death takes this incredible turn. There is this catastrophe we call death, but there is this you catastrophe, this ultimate turn of events where the ultimately bad becomes the ultimately good. This is why we call Good Friday Good Friday, even though the centerpiece of Good Friday is the most horrific thing that ever happened to a human being in all of history, the death of Jesus Christ upon the cross. So let's have some life and death conversations today. Good news, bad news. Ask people if they want to start with the good news or the bad news. Doesn't really matter which one they pick. I've been, um, I'm thinking about this today because, uh, Funerals get us thinking, right? And funerals get us talking about the reality of death and mortality and time and significance and what our epitaph is going to be and what people are going to stand up and say about us. That's the eulogy. That's the good words, right? Uh, And I spent this weekend tending to death-related things. So I had the privilege on Saturday of officiating at the funeral of a very, very dear good and godly, wonderful friend. And so I got to be with her precious husband and her family and our mutual friends. And it was a celebration of life because it was a celebration of of a life lived in relationship to Jesus Christ and about whose <laughs> eternal destiny we have no question. Like, there's just no question where, G, uh, where uh, Jesus is and where Tricia is because of where Jesus is. And so funerals get us thinking and talking about the reality of death, right? and mortality, even our own. Um, This weekend was also the 40th anniversary of my dad's death. So my dad died when he was 43, 40 years ago this past weekend. And um, 40 years is is a long time to live beyond somebody who really, according to the actuarial tables, should still be alive today. Like, it's crazy to think about that way. So you could have an actuarial table conversation with somebody today in the life or death conversation because, you know, death is, death is all around us all the time. I mean, you could use the revised numbers coming out of Gaza in terms of the number of people killed. You could use those. You could literally use those downwardly revised death counts today as a way to start a conversation about life and death because life is short. You could talk about somebody in your own community whose life, by our view, has been, quote, tragically cut short. Nobody in all of history has had a more tragically short life 
than Jesus. And yet he lives forever and ever. And because he lives, I can face the future. And because he lives, um, I have all hope. Right? Do you see how you can have these life and death conversations using just about anything? So the, the U.S. government has issued some life expectancy tables that are revised. So I checked mine because, you know, mortality and all. Uh, according to the U.S. government, see, this is important, right? What does the U.S. government think about my life expectancy? And then what do I think about my life expectancy? Because just by the way, just to let you know, full disclosure here, I'm going to live forever. I'm already living an eternal life. This happens to be the part of it I'm sharing with you. If you want to share it with me eternally, let me tell you how to do that. His name is Jesus. That is it. That is the way to the Father. That is the way home. He is the way and the truth and the life. He is the good shepherd who walks us through the valley of the shadow of death where we fear no evil because he is with us. Like, if you want to live forever, because I'm going to live forever, by the way, not here in this decaying body of flesh, but forever and ever. Raised with Christ, in whom I have put my full faith and confidence. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Like, that, that's who I am. That's what I'm doing, in case you were wondering. But according to the U.S. government, because they have a different view of things, mm -hmm. according to the U.S. government, my life expectancy today is 29.9 years. That's what they say I have left. Now, they don't actually know the number of my days, but God does. God's already numbered your days. Did you know that? My mom is already older than the Social Security Administration expects me to live. <laughs> so there you go. So there you have it. Um, it's strange to talk about death, maybe, because so many people fear it. I mean, do you fear it? And if so, why? So beginning today, I want you to start talking about life and death. I want you to start having life and death conversations. I want you to talk about it easily. I want it to come easily. I don't want it to be awkward or weird. I want it to be like you and me sitting down and saying, all right, you want the good news or the bad news? Well, you know, the good news is Jesus Christ has conquered death. Sin in the grave. The bad news is you're going to die. And so am I. But the good news is, you don't stay dead. There's a you catastrophe. There's a good turn. And so, yeah, you might spend time when you're talking about life and death, about all the good things that you might say about each other. Let me just go ahead and say this. I only really want one good thing said of me, the good news. That's it. I want my eulogy to be focused on the you catastrophe of the cross and the empty tomb, the euangelion, the good news of the gospel. And then the sending out of Uangalistas, you, as heralds of good news. Like, that's it. I don't, I mean, don't spend a lot of time saying nice things about me. Uh, uh, say really great things and good things and true things about Jesus. But all of this conversation about life and death does make me mindful of the fact that we need to tend to one another tenderly in grief. We need to tend to one another tenderly in grief. So let's continue our life and death conversation this morning, the good news and the bad news. And let's talk about the times we've spent in the valley of the shadow of death. If you had to make a list, maybe it would be points in time on the calendar. Maybe it would be, you know, as you look back over the course of your life, where have the where have the mm -hmm, descents been? Where, where are the times that you have descended into the valley of the shadow of death? With whom were you walking? Maybe you walked a friend or a loved one into and through the valley of the shadow of death, and, and then you had to be walked back out by Jesus. Every trip we take through the valley of the shadow of death makes us more able to walk it the next time. I've been walking in and out and in and out and in and out of the valley of the shadow of death for a long time. I actually know it really well. Do you? Because those of us who have become very familiar with the valley of the shadow of death and how to walk into and through it, 
we have a great ministry of tending tenderly to people as they face death. That's up next here on Mornings with Carmen. As we consider the life of Jesus and the life of the first generation of Christians, reading here the book of Acts and all the letters to the Christians in the New Testament, we see people who like wake up. They come to see and understand and then receive Jesus as their Savior and Lord. And it changes everything. We see Christians then telling other people about the good news and inviting them to respond in repentance, be baptized, and follow Jesus. The movement of Christianity grows person by person and then exponentially as people walking in darkness receive the light of Christ and want others to know what they know and have what they have. Well, you and I are living in dark days. People need light. And Jesus is the light of the world today in the same way that he was the light of the world at the beginning of creation and at the first Christmas and throughout his life on earth and in his radiance now at the right hand of the Father. Jesus is the light of the world. So if you're walking in darkness of any kind today, I invite you to consider Jesus. If you'd like to know more about what it means to begin a relationship with Christ or to chat with someone about it, just text the word FAITH to 41224. Let's have some life and death uh, conversations today. When you think about your life and the course of your life, um, who do you know who has lived and died? Who do you know that has lived and died? Because those are the journeys that you have taken into the valley of the shadow of death. And let me just say that, like, as Christians, we live as those prepared to die. Like, that's who we are as witnesses in the culture today. We bear living witness to the reality of a Christ who died. And because he rose from the dead, we live again. And most people around us live in open fear of death. They are trying to put it off at literally all costs. They fear it because they don't understand what's on the other side of it. They don't have a friend with whom they are walking into and through the valley of the shadow of death to a home not built by hands, where Jesus has gone before to prepare a place. And if he's gone before, then he will come back and take us to himself, that where he is, we may be also. We live in a generation much like, you know, Thomas expressed to Jesus. Jesus, you know, how could we, how could we end up where you're ending up? We don't, we don't know, we don't know where you're going and we don't know the way. And Jesus says, have I been with you all this time and you you don't know who I am? Like, I'm going to be with the Father. The Father and I are one. And Thomas, you know the way to where I am going. I am the way and the truth and the life. And Jesus says, no one comes to the Father except by me. But that also means, if you turn that statement around, you can be with the Father, with me. Come to me and come with me. I am the good shepherd with whom have you walked into and through the valley of the shadow of death, where believers fear no evil? Because as we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we do so with a faithful God who is our good shepherd. His rod and his staff, they comfort us. He prepares a table before us in the presence of our enemies. He anoints our heads with oil. Our cups overflow. Goodness and mercy, they follow us all the days of our life. Because we actually know we're going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. My friend, you don't need to fear death, nor the valley of the shadow of death. You can actually walk there in comfort and confidence and peace.
and you say to yourself, Carmen, maybe you're not very familiar with death and what it feels like. Maybe you're not very familiar with grief. Maybe you maybe you haven't been there enough times, girl, to know what you're talking about because you 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 talking crazy this morning about life and death. Um, I actually know the valley of the shadow of death really well. I have traveled it many times. I have spent a lot of time with the one who walks with us and talks with us and carries us all the way home to the Father's house. Do I know that the valley of the shadow of death is deep and dark and sometimes feels very desperate? Yeah, I do. But I also know that you do not have to walk there alone. You weren't designed to walk there alone. There is a good shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I don't have any needs because I am with him. I have walked through the valley of the shadow of death um, with people who have buried their children and their grandchildren their spouses, their neighbors, their parents, their grandparents, their colleagues, their teammates, their friends. And I recognize that there are a lot of people who fear death and who imagine that they can put it off forever that somehow for them, death will not come. That's that's a delusion. We need to walk honestly in, in conversations today about life and death, and we need to have life and death conversations because, my friend, I don't know when and I don't know how, but I can assure you, death comes. And it comes as a thief. And if you do not prepare yourself for it, and if you do not talk with those whom you love, that together you can be prepared for it, it comes as a thief who steals and destroys. But Jesus Christ has actually put death to death. That is the eucatastrophe of the cross and the resurrection. It's actually the eucatastrophe of the incarnation. The Jesus who took on flesh to dwell among us, he was born to die. But in his death, God creates anew the possibility of life and life eternal. That is the good news. The you catastrophe, the good turn, is the good news, the euangelion, that you and I, as the people of good news, the heralds of good news, now live to tell to others. Because right now, thanks for listening to Mornings with Carmen LaBerge. Podcasts like this are available because of your support. If it's important to you to hear things that encourage your faith, click the link in the show notes to give now. And thanks.